Connor's tea. How are ye? Welcome to the penultimate episode of the Battle of Ventry. This story was constructed by Aaron and Serica, based on the bilingual book by Avon O'Mara Hartig and Donal O'Brick. Produced and edited by Oshin Ryan, with music and sound effects by Oshin Ryan, and additional voices by Neil Toner and Rory O'Shea. This is brought to you by our supporters at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. And you can join them for access to bonus material on the writing and production of this project. Thank you for listening and enjoy. The Battle of Entry, Part 3. Although Con Crither had shown Gloss McDrowan the healing grove before, Gloss could not be certain that he would find the way, if left to his own devices. He knew it was not far from Ventry, not far from the strand where the battle was going on. But still, it seemed he could only get there by a strange twisty path that disappeared and reappeared into the woods. When they did get there, there was no mistaking it, because the grove that Con Crither led him to, the grove where the three daughters of the Tiber had their healing pool, was like no other that Gloss had ever seen. The trees were ordinary enough, ringing round them. The stream chattered and babbled as it flowed over rocks. But the three sisters, there was something strange about them. About the way they moved, as though the three of them were in a dance that they had practiced long before. Not to mention the way that they spoke. Come, Come warriors. warriors. Lay, Lay yourselves, yourselves down, down in the healing, healing pool. Healing pool. Let the waters waters wash your wounds wounds away. away. Be healed. Be Be restored. restored. They had diverted the stream so that it flowed into a pool. And this pool they had lined with stones so that its bottom was not muddy. But the water was not clear. It was clouded and scented with strange herbs and as Gloss and Con lowered themselves into the pool into its healing waters and Gloss felt the chill of it creeping up his body he could feel it beginning to go to work already soothing his hurts washing away his wounds and as they lay soaking in the healing waters Con Crither and Gloss McDrowan talked of the war. Grand, do you have any more of that? Me too. I think my head needs to forget what my body is healing from. We should stay alert. If we draw short straws tomorrow, we face Dollar Dorfa. <laughs> the king of the world doesn't even like him, you know, the Dollar Dorfa. That's why he sent out his brothers apart from him. He wanted them all to die, and he won't shed a tear when Dollar Dorfa himself meets his match. What match could he meet? He seems invincible. Mm. Oh, but we had reinforcements arrive today, you know. Twelve youths from Ulster, led by the king's son and Gaul. And not one of them with hair on his chin. <laughs> Fiona had Gaul tied up so he wouldn't get himself hurt in the fighting. Yeah, no much good that'll do him. Sure, that Dutter Dorf, uh, he could kill his hundred men a day and then fight his way to Ulster. I wish Fionn the Cool were a little less honourable. Then we could all attack him instead of sending him a hundred a day who drew the short straws. Sure, Fionn brought it to an all-out fight. He knows we'd lose it. They have thirty battalions and the Fianna have seven. And that's not to talk about the creatures kept in the bellies of those ships. I used to hear them at night during the crossing. Trust me, it's better to die by the hand of a man than be 
eaten alive by a creature from the fever tree. Fionn stood watching the fight with his own son, Oshin, and his grandson, Oscar, by his side. The fierce warrior, Dutterdorfa, was being matched blow for blow by this young boy from Ulster. The fight went up and down a long ventry bay, and the waves were beginning to crash closer and closer to them. Both armies watched from either side of the bay. Both awaited to find out who would be the victor. The young warrior had arrived from Ulster the night before. His name was Gull, and he was the king of Ulster's son. Now no other kings had sent their sons, Fionn thought. No other fighting force had come to their aid either. And Cormac MacArt, the High King of Ireland, was fairly quiet in his throne of Tara, he noted. But this youth had arrived the night before, and he was eager to take part in the fight this day. But Fiona tried to restrain his headstrong youth. He'd even literally tied him up. What with him being a king's son and all, but... He could not force Gull to sit still. The youth had demanded to be let loose. And now, he was proving to be a match for Dullardorfa. Fionn noticed the people watching. And Fionn noted, Fergus Fionn Vale mouthed the words of a song that was going into his head in account of recording this moment, straight to memory. Fionn knew then that this boy would be the brilliance and bravery that Gullner displayed, his deeds this day would remain on the lips of storytellers till the end of time. And as the sun dipped low, the shadows of the moving bodies stretched across the bay. The tide was washing in and creeping ever closer to the pair. As the light disappeared, they lost sight of the two fighting bodies and their dancing shadows on the shore. But as the sun rose, it shone on an empty bay, revealing two bodies entangled to the last, both men white and pale, blood drained from them, both drowned as they had both lost their lives Gloss MacDrowan came to the King of the World on his ship to bring him the news. It was not a man of the Fianna who had killed Dolardorfa after all. That body that he'd been clasped to, that he had drowned as he had been drowned, belonged to the King's son of Ulster. A boy of thirteen years. He came with twelve companions to win glory as boys think of it. To win glory in battle and prove himself a man. And Dollardorfa killed his twelve companions and all the Fianna laughed to see the boy rush out to take on that great warrior. And we stopped laughing when we saw him put six wounds on his body. The King of the World gave no answer for a time. He stared off, as if into a great distance, although they were inside the cabin of his ship. He was not looking at the windows. He looked, and he brooded, and Gloss MacDrowan waited, too nervous to shuffle his feet or clear his throat unwilling to interrupt the meditations of the king of the world. At last, the king of the world gave a little start, as if to wake himself from a reverie. He looked up at Gloss MacDrowan, and he said, 
It is time to end this. Even after Gloss McDrowan left, the King of the World did not give the order. Not immediately. This war had already been more costly than he had anticipated. The loss of the King of Spain, the King of France, the King of the Marshes, the loss of Dolardorfa and the Eight Sons of Garrow. All of these would have to be answered for. Their people would be unhappy with the King of the World, though their upset would be soothed by the bounty he would bring back from this newly conquered land. He had a weapon in his two greatest generals, And it was a weapon that he had used often. And it was a weapon that he had grown accustomed to. But it had not always been so. And as the king of the world sat in his cabin, he thought back. Back to his early days. Back to the days of his youth and his great conquests when he had taken to the field, secure in the knowledge that he could not die on a battlefield, when it was prophesied that no weapon forged by man could kill Dara Dun. And with this knowledge to buoy him, he had been at the head of every army, He had won glory for himself. He had conquered new lands and brought their subjects under his rule. And now, as he sat, he tried to remember when they had first come to him. He knew they had not always been there his two most trusted generals. But he knew that he had never lost a battle with them. He had come to rely on them. He could not remember when they had first come to him. But he knew that in those early days he had had a hesitation in putting them out into the field. He remembered feeling sick when he unleashed them, the nausea rising and bubbling in his stomach, seeing what they would do to a place, to a people, seeing their savagery, their inhumanity, because of course they were not human, not at all. He tried to remember when that disgust had gone away. Now, when he thought of unleashing them, it was only a faint pang that he himself would not be the one to conquer this land. But this had gone on long enough. Enough of his allies had died now. And he knew it was time to bring it to a close. And so Daradun, the king of the world, called on his two great generals to ready their forces and attack and end this once and for all. Now Dalv left the Fairy Mound and his father Shasnon after Brand attempted to get help. And he stood outside to watch the landscape mingle with clouds and mist. The heavy wind behind him blew the clouds down to surround him. He breathed in, and as he exhaled, he transformed and shape shifted into a breath of wind that carried him through the cloud. A 
across the land of hills and fields and down towards the waterway, where he landed on a stream that seemed to flow out from somewhere deep below. He floated along upstream and dove through the rocks till he fell into the ground deep, deep underground he found himself now standing once more in his own form, surrounded by echoing cadaverous caves. He saw crystals, emeralds, sapphires and jewels hanging ornamented throughout the cave till he spied the splendid host in the centre. Between two gleaming pillars they stood with shining spears and swords of white gold and gleaming silver in hand and in their centre stood Bove Darug, the king of the Tua de Danon. He stood tall amongst the glimmering host that surrounded him. His pale skin radiated brightness, and his emerald green eyes pierced dull as if he demanded the question who dares approach. Dahl bowed his head and attempted to answer. I have been sent by my father to ask you to help the people of Ireland. Athena will need your strength to defend the land against this invasion. Bove Darug glared down at Dahl. That is not our concern. Although Dahl knew there was very little point in trying to persuade the king of the Fae, he knew he had to try once more. Many of the Fina have our blood running through their veins. They would not hesitate to help us in a time of need if any such time were to arise. A war is a moment, and the moment will pass. Derek, your highness, these invaders do not intend to stay. They want to, to pillage, to plunder, to take what they want from Ireland's green shores and leave nothing but destruction wherever they came from. There was movement on the ships in Ventry Bay. A creaking of hatches, as warriors came up from where they had been sleeping in the holds. More and more and more of them. It was difficult to make out the details of them. There were so many of them, 
moving so quickly, going from deck to deck of all the ships that were laid out hull to hull over all the waters. From a distance, you might think the fleet had sprouted a strange fur, moving and creeping across it. But when they reached the white sand of Ventry Bay, their appearance became clearer. More and more and more poured out, and they assembled into their ranks and their regiments. And as they moved and they grouped on the sands, it began to be very clear that there was something terribly wrong with these warriors. The way that they moved was graceful, but there was a strangeness to that grace. It made it into something grotesque. They walked upright, and they held in their hands weapons, but their faces were not the faces of humans. They were furred and fanged, and they split themselves into two groups, snarling and hissing. And you could see then the army of the cat-headed warriors and the army of the dog-headed warriors with their generals on Ventry Beach. And when they gave their battle cry, it was enough to freeze the blood. Because in it was all the ferocity of tooth and claw, and all the intelligence and cunning of man and all the madness that came of this unnatural fusion of the two. And when it came to the ears of the Fianna, they understood well that they were doomed. Oscar of the Fianna spoke. <laughs> we'll fight them and win glory, and our names will never be forgotten. But Con Critter shook his head. Those things are not here to win a war. They are here to destroy us, root and branch. Our past as well as our future. They won't spare the bards and poets. They won't spare the learned. They will kill everyone on this island. Kill our language kill our memories. No one will remember the Fianna after this day. Their captain, Fionn McCool, looked out at the approaching horde. He put his thumb between his teeth. And then he said, Then we will fight regardless. We will not be the last to fight impossible odds and to die unseen, unheard, unremembered. We will not be the last. Countless men and women and even children have stood as a tiny spark in a howling storm, swallowed in an instant and lost as if they had never existed. And knowing that, they stood anyway. They defied anyway. They fought anyway. They are the truest heroes. They will be with us today as we fight and die and are forgotten. We will join with them. And in times to come, Whenever anyone struggles against the impossible we, the Forgotten will stand with them, 
They will find within them a strength they did not know they had, the source of which they cannot explain. The strength of the forgotten warriors. Those who never give up. The strength that we will find today. Because today we will die. And we will be forgotten. And the Fianna made ready then to go to their deaths. <laughs> <laughs>